Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church. We are so glad you're here. I'm Sarah Kropp. I'm the nursery director and I would love to meet with you after service and talk to you more about our nursery ministry. Our church gathers around the person and work of Jesus. Whether you are curious or committed, Jesus invites us all to follow him. Listen to this invitation to worship from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Make sure I can hear things. There we go. We got it. All right. Well, it's good to see you guys. Um, I'm excited to sing this song. We haven't sung it in a while, so if it's new to you, that's okay. It's called Jesus, Fount of Joy Eternal, recognizing that he's the one true source of lasting joy. And so I know we're still waking up, but we're going to try to be happy. All right. You ready? So let's put our hands together and sing this out. There's your clap beat. Also, I have my wife singing with me, which makes me happy, so that's good stuff. All right, let's sing this out. Here we go. Sing Jesus found a joy. He 
You're the resurrection that we've waited for. You buried the night, you came with the morning. You're the king of heaven, the praise is yours. The longer the quiet, the louder the chorus. especially is sort of this tender moment. Um, but I love to sing it, and I encourage you, especially men, we have lots of manly men here singing with us. This is a, this is a bridge, this is a, a moment of surrender, asking God to come and soften up the soil of our hearts, to grow what he wants there. And that's an important thing to do. So I just want to encourage you guys, especially the men, let this be a moment of saying, God, do what you want to do in my heart. Let's sing this out.
We want to pause for a moment of confession and assurance of God's grace. Um, Christians for 2,000 years have made this uh, the central focus of what it means to be a Christian, and that is to admit that we need a king that will forgive us, admit that we need a leader besides ourselves to lead us. Uh, and so I want to give you some time just to silently confess ways that you have rebelled against God, ways that you've wandered from him. And after a time of silent confession, I'll pray a prayer of thanksgiving for God's grace in Jesus. Let's pray. God, we confess the same problem with the world, the brokenness out there is inside of us and in our own hearts. We confess that we've wandered from you, that we've sinned against you. We confess that even though we do everything in our power to deny our guilt, we we are guilty before a holy and perfect and righteous king. We thank you that you're the king that gave yourself for us. We thank you that you're the one that made the perfect sacrifice to forgive us. We thank you that you rule and reign, that you conquered sin and death, even though you died in our place, you rose from the dead. And so we can have a confidence that you are king, that you are ruler of the universe. Help us to rest in the forgiveness we have in you, to recognize the deep love the Father has bestowed on us by giving us the Son, and then help us to obey you of the freedom and the joy we have in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
It says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Um, so there's this idea that at the cross, when Jesus paid the full price, when he rose again, our freedom was accomplished. It was bought perfectly, and that's done. Grace is said for, spoken for. And so we're God's children, no matter what, if we trust in him. And so, but we go back to living in our old ways, or we... We think we're still slaves because we've been so long used to that. And so this is kind of the idea that we need God to ring a giant bell and remind us that we are free in him. Um, and then we are going to join in that song of freedom louder than the dark. We're going to sing and ring these bells that anyone can be set free through Jesus. Uh, so that's the idea, okay? So it's a reminder for our own hearts that we keep straying from that and acting in our old ways, but we don't need to because we're perfectly free in Jesus, okay? Make sense? So let me let me teach this to you. As I go. Some of you guys know this, so sing it double loud if you know. So it goes like this. Here's the chorus. Go like this. Ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Let the drums of kingdom come and be the beating of our hearts. Keep our souls awake, make us holy as you are. Ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Okay, that's the, that's how I go. Sing this out. So ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Let the drums of kingdom come and be the beating of our hearts. Keep our souls awake, make us holy as you are. Ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Here's how the verses go. Heavenly Father, finish your work in us. Our hopes have wandered, our hearts will ever slow to trust. Show us your goodness, cast out our fear with love. Remind your children that you've already won. Ring the bells of freedom, louder than the dark. Let the drums of kingdom come and be the beating of our hearts. Keep our souls awake. As holy as you are, bring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Woo. Sing this truth. When we were helpless, could often fall away. You sent King Jesus, you paid the price we couldn't pay. When we feel orphaned, when shame would make us run, come to your children. That crazy said and done. Ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. Let the drums of kingdom come and be the beating of our hearts. Keep our souls away, make us holy as you are. Ring the bells of freedom louder than the dark. this song, um, I don't know if you've seen this um, diagram that Dave showed us before, um, but it talks about as our understanding of the depth of our sin grows, as our understanding of God's holiness grows, that the cross in between gets bigger and bigger. We recognize more and more what it was that Jesus did for us. So let's sing these words out. That's what this, this part of the song is trying to explain. It goes like this. Further still, further still, further still, sin separated us. Greater still, greater still, greater 
true in our hearts. Jesus, we thank you for giving us everything that we need for life and godliness, for calling us out of the dark, for making us new creations in you. I pray that you will help us to live like it, to not forget the price that you paid and our state before you. We've been redeemed. We live in the already, but not yet. We know we're safe in you. We pray that you will continue to work in our hearts to make us holy, to help us to show our love and obedience. We pray that you will refine our affections by your word today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. Good morning and welcome again. We have a few announcements this morning. The first is that if you will look under your seat in front of you, there are blue connect cards. Um, if you have never filled one out before or this is your first time at Grace Bible Church, if you could fill that out for us and we will swap you for a free Grace Bible Church mug on the back table. So find somebody with a name tag and swap with them um, or you can also drop it in the offering box in the back. Next, uh, at Grace Bible Church, we encourage each other to follow Jesus, and we do this in three simple ways. The first is to gather and worship, which is what we're doing here. Um, the next is to serve on a team. Uh, we had serve team huddle and some serve team signups recently, but you can still sign up to serve um, on any of our teams. Um, and then the last is to join a group. Um, we have different groups meeting in homes or at the church. We also have larger groups like Celebrate Recovery and Women's Ministry on Thursdays. Um, so if you would like to know more about any of those things, email the office at begrace.org. The next uh, Hope Pregnancy Center is having a celebration, a life celebration banquet. And this is actually sold out. I was told this this morning. But we still want you to encourage and support Hope Pregnancy Center. Their goal and mission is to help people facing unplanned pregnancies. Um, so you can still donate to them, um, probably looking at that website, um, and support their mission and ministry. Next, uh, statistically speaking, uh, unchurched people will come to church if they are invited by a friend. So we are making this easier by giving you invite cards for Easter Sunday. Um, Easter Sunday is like the big Super Bowl Sunday for the church. Lots of people will come to church that day. Um, so to make it easier to invite your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, grab an invite card on the back table um, and then be sure to invite people. Next, Easter Sunday is coming up, March 31st, and we will have three services. There will be a sunrise service, 6.45 a.m. at Ellison High School practice fields. 
Um, and then we'll have our services here at 9 and 11. Um, so be sure to pray if you're available to serve on one of the teams. Um, I know for nursery and elementary, we need all the people to invite all the kids, okay? So if you are available and you can serve, let us know. Um, and then be sure to invite people. We are hiring at Grace Bible Church for a full-time office administrator. So this job will be open April 1st. Um, if you are interested, if you will email the office at bgrace.org and apply um, for that. And lastly, stay connected following us on Facebook, Instagram, or on the website. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We have a quick business update, and then we're going to look at the scriptures together. So uh, just real quickly, I uh, want to give a kind of state of the union. Things are going really well as a church in general. Before, before I get to the budget part of it, um, things are going really well. We're really thankful uh, sponsoring new global outreach partners that uh, we've just met. We had a big, successful surf team huddle, a lot of new people signing up. We're excited about that. Um, our youth has basically doubled in size. We're excited to see that, uh, a lot of young people interested in following Jesus and learning more about him, uh, other ministries that are around the church, the women's ministry, the men's ministry, uh, the navigators ministries uh, that we partner with that meets on Friday nights, uh, just a lot of growth and a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so thank you for your involvement. Thank you for being eager to follow Jesus with us. We're, we're excited about that. Now I have a little bit of bad news. It's not terrible news, a little bit of bad news. We're a little, we're a little behind financially, so let me throw the numbers up for you. Uh, our monthly goal is 71000 a month. Our January giving was 65000 It's usually a little bit of a dip in January, so that wasn't super scary to us. A little more of a dip in February. We did have some financial, you look at March 3rd, just March 3rd alone was huge. So we did have a little bit of an error there where we think some of uh, the funds from February might have gotten pushed into March. Uh, but overall, you can just see that we're tracking a little lower than we'd like to be. So um, two things. Number one if you're just investigating the claims of Jesus, we encourage you to not give. Just investigate the claims of Jesus. We're excited you're here. Uh, we consider it a privilege that we would get to share the good news with you, to share the scriptures with you. Um, but if you are someone whose heart, whose will has been captured um, by Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would encourage you to partner with us financially if you're able to do that. So pray about ways that you could partner financially. I think sometimes people look forward to this ideal where they could give a lot of money they want to give. Uh, what's really helpful to us is if you could just make um, some disciplined decisions to give a little bit on a regular basis. Uh, just making that more consistently helps us as a church to have more consistency with our budget. Um, but pray about that. Uh, we give because Jesus has given to us. We don't give to get God's attention. And so we just have to clarify that because that's taught exactly backwards in most churches in America today. Um, so the only reason you would give is because Jesus has already captured your heart and you're excited about sharing Jesus with this community, but with the rest of the world. So encourage you to partner with us. Uh, we're trusting the Lord to continue to provide for us as he always has in the past. And want to say thank you for those of you that are already supporting. Thank you for your uh, financial giving and thank you for your support. All right, we're going to change gears now. Open up your Bibles. We're going to look at the scripture together. Uh, we are looking at Luke chapter 23, continuing this series at the end of Luke called The Last Days of Jesus. The last days of Jesus, we see Jesus coming and presenting himself as the king of Jerusalem and also the king of the universe. But ironically, he's enthroned, he's inaugurated through death and suffering and resurrection. Uh, they didn't see it coming, but this is the story, the greatest story in the world. This week, as we turn the corner into Luke chapter 23, it'll be on page 882 in the Black Bibles under the chairs if you want to follow along there. Luke chapter 23. It's not guilty. Not guilty. That's the big idea. Not guilty. You're going to hear that phrase repeated again and again in the text. You're going to hear a repetition of Pilate. That's the name of the representative of Rome. The representative of Caesar in Jerusalem was Pilate, and he continues to declare, he continues to hand down the judgment, not guilty. And there's a great irony here because Jesus, in the end, is condemned as guilty. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the story To Kill a Mockingbird. Anybody know that story, To Kill a Mockingbird? 
I remember the first time I saw that story, uh, or I guess I read it in literature class in high school, read it first, and you're just shocked at that guilty verdict that's uh, given to this man because of racism. This guy that didn't do it, he's guilty. It's just upsetting. I saw the movie later on. Again, I'm upset, even though I know what's going to happen, right? It's just like you're still surprised and shocked. I saw the movie later on as an adult, uh, an older adult, and I was, again, shocked and surprised and frustrated by this guilty verdict that's given to the man that's not guilty. Um, Even some of my family members acted in the play in community theater. Again, I was shocked. It's like, I know the story, and it's still making me mad. Um, And that's what's going to happen when we read the text today. It's supposed to Uh, show you this crazy juxtaposition of, but wait, he's not guilty. What's happening? This is is not justice. What's going on here? And so Luke's going to repeat these terms. You're going to see it again and again, not guilty. Let's read chapter 23, verses 1 through 25. And I think it's important, we'll see this more as we move through the text uh, and explain it. I think it's important that we recognize how angry we feel that Jesus is not guilty, but he's condemned and recognize that we are actually guilty. We are actually guilty. And that's going to become more clear as we move through the morning. Let's read the text, chapter 23. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. So the whole company of the Jewish leaders now are taking him to the official Roman leaders because they cannot condemn a man to death. They don't have that authority. Verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. Let me pray for us. God, we pray that you would teach us who you are, what you're doing in history, We thank you for your word. We believe that you speak authoritatively through these words, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would join us in this time as we study it, as we listen, that your Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear what is happening, that you would, by your Spirit, open up our eyes to the reality that Jesus is not guilty, but we are, and because he's been sacrificed for us, we can also be declared not guilty. We pray that you teach us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the big theme of the story uh, as it unfolds in chapter 23 is that Jesus is not guilty. Like, that's the big idea, right? It gets repeated multiple times. Herod and Pilate both confirm this. Pilate keeps trying to set him free, and the people keep saying, no, we, we want his blood. We want this man to be killed. Jesus is not guilty. And here's the thing. We are guilty. Jesus is not guilty. We 
are guilty. And so we get angry when we see someone not guilty being put away, and we forget in our anger that we're not the judge, but we're actually the one that's also guilty, that's being set free. And so it's a really important thing for us to keep in balance, for us to recognize the tension here. Jesus is not guilty. 2 Corinthians 5.21 summarizes this whole concept. We call it the substitutionary atonement, right? One who is not guilty was substituted for us who are guilty. That's the substitutionary atonement. Jesus takes our place. That's the big idea. And so 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our guilt is placed on Christ. Christ's perfect righteousness, if you trust him, is placed on you. You are hidden in Christ. If you trust in what God the Father has done through Jesus, if you declare Jesus as Lord, if you give yourself to him, and the Father sees you as delightful, as righteous, as perfect in Christ. You're covered in him. You're hidden in him. You're righteous in him. He's not guilty. We are all guilty. But that's the, that's the big idea that we want to take away this morning. It's interesting in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where Paul is saying that so clearly that Jesus became sin in our place so that we might become his righteousness. He also says one verse earlier We're ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So Paul is saying, because this news is true, we want to share it with other people. And so number one this morning, I hope that your hearts are captured by the reality that the one who is not guilty took your place. But number two, I hope like Paul, your hearts are so captured by this reality that you want to share it with other people that you love. So we're going to see three things unfold in the story. Number one, we're going to see the religious condemn him. The religious condemn him. Number two, we're going to see the pagans mock him. The pagans mock him. And then number three, we're going to see that the guilty are set free. The guilty are set free. So number one, the religious condemn him. The religious condemn him. This is what's always happened. Religious people condemn the one who's truly righteous. Part of the problem here is when we're trying to be justified by religion, that puts us in competition with others. And if you've got someone that's more religious than you, and you're trying to win the religion race, you got to take them out. You got you to cut the knees, right? You got to throw them down so that you can be first place. And that's a little bit of what we see taking place here. Jesus is not guilty, but we are guilty. And we, just like the religious, want to condemn him. Verse 1 says, again, the whole company, these are the religious leaders, they arose and brought him before Pilate. Verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Did he actually forbid people to give tribute to Caesar? Anybody know? No. He was asked point blank. He's like, no, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. But he did call himself Christ, which is a king, the ultimate king of the Jews, the Christ, the greatest king of all. He did claim to be that Christ. Verse 3, and Pilate asked him, well, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you've said so. So he answers kind of passively. We get a lot more detail again in Matthew, Mark, John, these other gospels. It's pretty sparse here, the way Luke presents it. Luke just wants you to kind of see the simple idea that this man is innocent and he's condemned as guilty, even though he's not guilty. Verse 4, then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. I find no guilt in this man. Now again, we know because of the other gospels, there's a lot more uh, investigating and a lot more quizzing and a lot more talking that goes on. This isn't it, right? This is a summary. But still, Pilate's like, this dude is not guilty. He is not guilty. He can tell that there's manipulation taking place on behalf of the Jewish leaders. But they were urgent, saying he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. So the religious condemn him, even though he's not guilty. It's a literary theme we'll see in a lot of stories in our society, and it often ticks us off when non-biblical stories do this. This theme of the really strict religious person secretly being naughty. You know that theme? It makes us so angry. Um, it comes up again and again. And we think it's those people picking on our people, right? Sometimes it is. But here's the thing. Pagans can recognize hypocrisy, right? Even though they don't know the answer is actually following Jesus, 
they can still recognize the hypocrisy of religious leaders living the wrong way, not actually being good shepherds. And it comes up again and again in the Bible. So I'm not saying we have to embrace every pagan critique of Christianity. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying a lot of times they're right. A lot of times they're right. Uh, famous literary work, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Never read the book, but I did see the movie. Uh, <laughs> there's this creepy dude, this priest, right? And he's just obviously the bad guy. Now, what's interesting, I don't, I don't know who, you know, I don't trust Disney, but there's probably some, some secret Christians that work there sometimes. There were some interesting reversals there. There's some interesting kind of symbols that could hint at the Christian story, where the religious leader is condemning, and yet this outsider, the hunchback, is being sacrificial, right? Maybe, maybe you could go there. Here's the big idea. Who, I'm not trying to justify that movie. The big idea is that religious people often condemn what is good and true and right, and that just comes up again and again in Scripture. We don't even have to look at the rest of Scripture. It's there, right? Ezekiel talks about it a lot, bad shepherds and stuff. But just in Luke, just what we've seen in the Gospel of Luke, um, Luke chapter 10, you got religious people not loving this guy that's beat up, but you got the Samaritan, the outsider pagan, loving him. And Jesus is like, which example should you follow, right? Luke chapter 15, he contrasts the two brothers, and he's like, there's the obvious pagan sinner, rebel brother. Of course, he did the wrong thing, but he repented, and the Father rejoices when people repent. There's the religious guy that doesn't think he has anything to repent from. Religious people, we often think, but I'm on the right team. I don't have to repent. I'm doing good, and God has to bless me for doing the good stuff, right? And we fall so easily into this salvation by works, becoming judgmental because we think it's actually about our own performance. Luke chapter 18, the simplest one, it's the Pharisee versus the tax collector, right? The Pharisee is like, thank you, God, that I'm not a bad person. And then the tax collector's like, God, have mercy on me. I'm bad and I need help. And Jesus says, one of those guys is actually made right. One of those is actually declared not guilty by God. And it's the one who asks for mercy. It's not the one that says, hey, I haven't done anything wrong. That person actually is guilty. So number one, religious membership, religious worship, or other external marks of religion are not enough to make us not guilty before God. Only Jesus as our sacrifice, as our substitute, is enough to make us acceptable before a holy God. Such an important thing. We need grace from a generous God. And then we want you to go all in, right? We want you to be religious. We want you to read your Bible. We want you to pray. We want you to help old ladies across the street. We want you to care for orphans and widows. We want you to tell your neighbors about Jesus. We want you to go on mission trips. We want you to teach Sunday school. We want you to be righteous and holy. We want you to put away immorality. We want you to do all those things, but doing the things is not what wins God's attention. Who won God's attention? It was Jesus, the one who is not guilty that was sacrificed in our place. And because he did that, that enables us to start doing the good things. And that's the difference. A clue that we're headed down this path as religious people is this. We're faithfully serving God, we're trying to do the right thing, and then suffering comes in our life. And when suffering comes in our life, we want to yell at God, and we're like, but God, I've been doing the right things. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. But God, I did the right things. Why aren't you blessing me? And that's a sign that we are living out of line with the gospel. Now, again, we said this last week. Lament is right and good. Jesus lamented in the garden. Jesus prayed, if there's any other way, take this cup of suffering from me. Yet not my will, your will be done. The, the entire book of Psalms is all about lament, right? We can grieve and we can say, how long, O oh Lord? I'm tired. I'm hurting. I need you. I'm broken. Why does it have to hurt that bad? We can pray those prayers. But just recognize that turn in your heart where you think, but I deserve better. Because of my track record, I've been performing and you're supposed to bless me. Our model, the one we're following, is the one who performed perfectly and gave it all up as a sacrifice. His entire life was, was burnt out giving to others. And he invites you and me to follow in his footsteps. And he says, at the end, it'll all be all right. But in this life, we're, we're spending, we're, we're burning, we're sacrificing. The entire argument of Romans 1, 2, and 3 is showing that it's not just religion that saves you, but it's Jesus 
So it uh, starts off, Romans chapter 1 says, uh, the irreligious are obviously condemned. We all know that. They're bad, right? They're in trouble. And then he turns and he's like, oh yeah, religious, also condemned. And so the high point of the argument is Romans 3.23, a famous argument that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He's showing that it's, it's not about being religious or not religious. It's about Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus is not guilty so that you and I can become not guilty. Jesus is condemned in our place, even though he is not guilty, so that we can be set free even though we are guilty. It's a flipping around and a substitution of what Jesus has done for us. Romans 3.26 says, It was to show his righteousness at this present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the big thing here is that we would trust in Jesus more than our good works. Should we do good works? Yes, do good works. But trust in Jesus is the secret. At number two, we'll see that the pagans mock him. The pagans mock him. So Jesus is not guilty. We are guilty. Jesus is condemned as guilty. But if we trust him, we can be set free as not guilty. Pagans mock him. We'll see this in verse 6 as he's handed over to Herod. And just an aside here, um, I don't think I even understood this whole dynamic until I went to Israel. I was like, ah, now it makes sense. The Romans had carved up Israel into quadrants, sections, right? So Pilate was the governor over the section where Jerusalem was. He was in charge of that area. And King Herod was in charge of the northern area where Galilee was. So Herod was in charge of where Jesus grew up. But Pilate was in charge of the place the trial's taken, uh, taking place. So that's why there's kind of some back and forth, right? Uh, Pilate's like, oh, he's from Galilee. I'll send him to the other guy, right? He's trying to shove him off. But really, it's happening in Jerusalem. So in the end, it ends up being Pilate's jurisdiction and responsibility. But that's why there's a little back and forth here. So chapter 23, verses 6 through 16, pagans mock him. Verse 6, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. At one point in chapter 13 of Luke, we're told that Herod wanted to kill him. Uh, In other places, we're told that he was curious about him, because he was thinking he was like the resurrected John the Baptist, or the ghost of John the Baptist or something, right? So Herod was like the superstitious pagan guy, and he... Uh, was of mixed Jewish descent, so the true Jews didn't really see him as a true Jewish king, but he was the most Jewish of the governors they had, right? He was more Jewish than Pilate, who was straight up Roman, yet he lived as a pagan. Um, That was part of why John the Baptist was killed, because John the Baptist was uh, telling him, you're not living in a righteous way according to God's laws, right? And so he got killed for that. Okay, so he wanted to see Jesus, verse 9. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. Verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt, and they mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. This word splendid uh, is a word that can just mean bright, uh, and so it can mean like pure, bright, sparkly linen that's uh, bleached white, or it can mean like beautiful purple cloth. You've probably heard some in the ancient world. That would have been the fanciest kind of color of kings because the dye was very expensive. I grabbed a picture uh, of King Louis before uh, the revolution. Uh, The French, I think, I don't know about you, but for me, that's just when I think of like splendid, ridiculous robes, that's what I think of. Um, And so they're dressing him up in kind of silly, over-the-top kingly robes. If you're French, I'm sorry, I apologize, but it is St. Patrick's Day. Um, (laughs) And so, if you know, you know. Have you noticed I got the orange and the green? Anyway, that's another thing. So, just a, just a picture, just to get in your mind, right? We don't know what they had on hand, but they had something that was silly, that was bright, that was colorful to make fun of him, right? On the one hand, kingly. On the other hand, it was a mocking gesture. And so, that's what they're doing. They're making fun of him. The pagans are mocking him. Verse 12, Herod and Pilate actually became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. A lot of scholars note the irony here. Even though they're both unbelievers that reject the lordship of Christ, Christ can't help but bring people together. (laughs) Uh, The the Jewish leaders that all hated each other, that were different sects, different varieties of Judaism, they all came together to kill Jesus and the pagan rulers that also were not believers, that were also in rebellion against this God. They also were brought together 
through the trial of Jesus. Verse 13, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Verse 15, neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. So there's a distinction between uh, big issues that deserve death, and just as an aside from what we understand from history, Pilate had gotten in trouble for being overly harsh on the Jews, for being too rough, so it makes sense that now he's like trying to pull back a little bit and not trying to, to kill too many people, right? He'd gotten in trouble for that in the past. So here he's like, dude, this, this guy doesn't deserve death. Let me just beat him and send him away, right? He stirred up some trouble, so we'll beat him, but he shouldn't be killed. And so that's the line that Pilate is making here. I will therefore punish him and release him. So again, we've got the pagans mocking him. The pagans are making fun of him, dressing him up, uh, saying that he is ridiculous. Uh, we've got the accusing uh, Jewish leaders, but we've also got Herod and his guards. And we see that this is a theme again and again through Scripture. Um, God is always saving underdogs. God is always saving outsiders. And even though pagans mock our Lord, God is still changing pagans' minds all the time. I hope you see that. And so I have kind of a double application here. One is to recognize that those who we see as outsiders, God has a heart for them, and he's always calling them to himself. Those that we see as the worst of the worst, the obvious pagan sinners, right? Romans chapter 1, oh, they're, they're really bad. God can't save them. No, God is saving them as well. God is always calling to outsiders. It's also important that we put ourselves in the shoes of these mockers, we sang a song about our mocking voice calling out among the scoffers earlier. We're guilty as well. We're guilty for belittling God, for condemning the righteous standards of a holy God as exhibited in the life of Jesus. We're guilty of the same thing. And so we have to recognize that. Jesus is not guilty, but he's condemned as guilty. We are guilty and if we trust in Jesus, we actually can be set free as not guilty. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 says that God does this thing of exchanging uh, those who are guilty for the not guilty, of giving grace and forgiveness and loving kindness to those who are weak, to those who are bad, to those who are broken. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 says that God does this to make his love more clear to make his grace uh, more clarified, to, to, to bring it into focus. Ephesians 2 says this as well. God is always working to save a people who are unsavable so that it can be clear that it's the sovereignty of God that saves us. It's his grace. It's his kindness. It's not what we have done. And the only response we can have to that is faith. We, we can't say, oh, I, I deserve to be saved. No, we're a mocker just like they are. We can only reach out with hands of faith and say, have mercy on me, a sinner, as we saw in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. 1 Corinthians 1 says it this way, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it's written, let no one, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so we've got this tension again and again in Scripture where we're told we cannot boast before God. We have nothing to boast in. And then Paul's like, but if you're going to boast, you boast in the Lord. You boast in what the Lord has done. You boast in such a way that you're like, it's, it's God, it's not me. It's God's grace. It's not uh, what I have accomplished. Now I want to have kind of turn the corner for, for one more application of this concept before we move on to the next point, and that is this. Which stamp of pagan approval might you and I be longing for? Here we see our leader and our savior being mocked by the pagans. And more and more in society, we live in a, a time, a period, 
where Christians are mocked more openly than they used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago. If our, if our Savior is going to be mocked, we're probably going to be mocked, right? And so which of these things are the ones that have the deepest hooks in your heart? Uh, are you longing for honor at work? Or are you willing to be mocked along with Jesus? Are you longing for popularity? Just people liking you? Or are you willing to be mocked along with Jesus? Are you longing for money, success? Or are you willing to be mocked with Jesus? Are you longing for perfect health? Or are you willing to be mocked and condemned with Jesus? What about academic respectability? Do you want to be seen as the smart guy, the smart girl? Or are you willing to be mocked with Jesus? Jesus is not guilty, but if we trust in him, even though we're guilty, we can be declared not guilty as well. Uh, and that brings us to the last point. The guilty are set free. It's this big kind of high point of the story where Barabbas is actually set free. It's interesting, his name means son of the father. Isn't that an interesting name? Barabbas' name means son of the father. So we see that the guilty are set free in verses 18 through 25, uh, starting in verse 18. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. Now we got more details in the other gospels about this. Uh, there was this exchange like on high festivals or some kind of tradition. And you see this in a lot of other Greek and Roman cultures as well. So it's kind of attested in other places. Um, but they would have this tradition of like, hey, we're going to give someone away for you to show that we're a benevolent you know, Roman leadership to you Jews. We'll, we'll honor you during your festival by setting someone free, right? It's part of the celebration. Clemency a pardon of some kind. And it, and it seems the logic here is that maybe Pilate was offering up Barabbas because he was the worst and most disgusting, rebellious guy, you know, the insurrectionist, the murderer. So in his mind, he was thinking like, oh, I'll offer up him and then Jesus will have to go free because they're not going to take Barabbas, right? But Pilate is uh, surprised. They say, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. You can catch that? He's repeated it twice, just to be clear, right? Jesus is not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Barabbas is guilty of insurrection and murder. Make sure you don't miss it. He says it again. Barabbas is guilty of insurrection and murder. You should see yourself in the place of Barabbas. I should see myself in the place of Barabbas. The one who was guilty... For whom they asked, he was set free, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Interesting uh, phrase here where it says that their voices prevailed. Their voices prevailed. It's a, a battle term. It's a fighting term, right? So the Jewish leaders won a battle with Rome. They won the fight. What, what was the fight? The fight was this not guilty man should be killed. That was the fight. And this is crazy I've been trying to figure out a clear way to say this, but it's like judo, right? Um, just like the substitutionary atonement is someone not guilty taking our place so that we can be declared not guilty, right? There's some flipping back and forth there. The scene is, is kind of crazy, right? They, they wanted a king who would fight Rome. And the more they understood that Jesus was not that kind of king, he kept saying, no, you need a king that's going to defeat sin and death. You need a different kind of king, right? Your problem's not really Rome. Your problem goes much deeper than Rome. You have a heart problem. You have a sin problem. They're like, no, that's not the kind of king we want. And here's the irony. They, they give that king over to Rome. They want a king to defeat Rome, and they're like, here. And they, they hand him over on a platter. And they actually win the battle. They prevail by their voices through their mob rule, handing over the king that they've rejected. It's insane. They finally win a battle with Rome, and it's handing over their king. So they prevailed over the Roman governor with mob voices, and now Rome will prevail over their king, even though Rome didn't want to. Pilate's like, I don't want to kill this guy. Don't make me kill this guy. Don't make me do this. And they're like, no, we want you to kill our king. But here's the beautiful thing. 
that God in his infinite wisdom is continuing to flip things around. Irony after irony, that's actually how the ultimate enemy, the ultimate monster of sin and death is defeated once and for all, is by Jesus who truly is not guilty being handed over in our place. So he takes our sins upon himself on the cross. He dies in our place. He's the ultimate Passover lamb. Remember, again, this is Passover. He's offered as the ultimate Passover lamb in our place to to wipe away our sins, to set us free. Um, We've talked over Christmas time about Isaiah 52 and 53 um, prophesying this. Uh, We also see language in Hebrews that prophesies this. All of the sacrifices of the Old Testament as rituals, as symbols prophesied this, even if they weren't um, direct prophecies, right? They were giving us pictures of what it was going to look like. We have a picture here of Zerubbabel's uh, famous Passover lamb, sacrificial lamb. It's a piece of art that floats around the internet all the time. Um, the idea is that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. God had, God had kind of built this into their consciousness again and again. Sacrifices need to be made. Uh, blood needs to be spilled so that our sins can be washed away. But Hebrews 9 clarifies He has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is a once and for all sacrifice. This isn't like the repeated sacrifice of the animals in the Old Testament. This is a different, ultimate sort of sacrifice in Jesus. And the author to Hebrews goes on in chapter 10 and says, It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, sitting down is important. It's a kingly act, and it's the act of someone who's completed their work. Really important symbols here. He finished the work. It's done. It's complete. The sacrifices are finished. It says he's waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There's this kind of final completion, uh, and the argument in Hebrews is that it is finished. It's complete. We'll see the completion of it through death, right, or the return of Christ, whichever comes first. That's when we'll see and experience fully every tear being wiped away, sin being no more, disease being no more. But it's complete now. We are completely reconciled to God. We are forgiven. We are in his family. We're adopted by his grace. This once and for all sacrifice that sets the guilty free. The guilty are set free. So just like Barabbas, we're guilty. We're an insurrectionist. We're a murderer, right? James says, if we ever say anything bad about somebody, we're a murderer, right? So what does that mean? You're all murderers. I'm a murderer. We're guilty before holy God. We're like Barabbas, and we're, we're set free. We're set free because of Jesus. This exchange is a really important thing for us to come to terms with. There's been a lot of critiques theologically over the last 20 years that the fundamentalist church, the reformed church, the evangelical church is too obsessed with this concept of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And for those of you that don't read theology, you're like, what? How could that be? Like, that's everything, right? Uh, It is a central, important piece of theology. But there's all these other spokes of the wheel, right? There's all these other spokes of like our uh, discipleship to God. He's our Lord. He's our King, right? We need to obey Him. That's important too. In biblical churches, we still teach that, right? Uh, There's this other concept that we should love our neighbors and that we should be restored to full community through the reconciliation we have between us and God. And we're like, well, yeah, that's in the Bible too, right? We're not saying that's not true. And so let me help you think through this if you hear some of those um, critiques. There's a critique that makes sense when it says all we talk about is Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We don't teach the rest of the Bible. We're like, yeah, we need to teach the rest of the Bible. But this is the really important truth. Don't let anybody take this truth away from you. The sacrifice of Jesus is central. The sacrifice of Jesus is what enables us to declare that Jesus is Lord and to begin to obey him. We can't have the one without the other or any of the other perspectives out there. We can only have those things because of this action that God has given us in Christ. So that's an important thing for us to keep central. 
in our life. We, we have here death and bondage solved by Jesus. His sacrifice moves us from death to life, right? The, the sacrifice moves us from death to life, as Romans 6.23 describes. And then his redemption purchases us, purchases us our freedom, right? We were in bondage, and now we have freedom. The song we were singing earlier, Ring the Bells of Freedom. We're set free to love, celebrate, enjoy, follow, obey Jesus because of what Jesus has done for us. So don't, don't miss this as the beginning and the everyday foundation of your relationship with God. We should wrap up here. Um, the big idea is not guilty, right? The big idea is that Jesus is not guilty. That's what Luke wants to hammer for us. But then he kind of finishes with, but hey, the guilty guy's set free. And we can experience this as well. We should see ourselves as the Jewish leaders, the religious people that condemn the good one, the righteous one. We should see ourselves as the pagans that mock Jesus. But we should also see ourselves as Barabbas, the murderer who is set free because of the forgiveness offered in Jesus, because of the substitution of Jesus. Um, there was a play that was written after World War II uh, by a, a German I think he was actually a German pastor, but he wrote this play to kind of help Germans deal with the guilt and the shame they felt because of the rise of the Nazis. The play was called The Sign of Jonah. In the play, different characters are studied from the SS officer down to the milkman, from the prison camp guard down to the housewife, but everyone in the play is blaming someone else for what went wrong. Everyone else in the play is blaming someone else, and as the play progresses, the characters begin to decide that it's not just someone else's fault, it's actually God's fault. They begin to decide that it's God's fault for letting something so awful happen. They actually try him and persecute him, prosecute him. They condemn him to humiliation, torture, betrayal, and death. And of course, by the end of the play, you realize yeah, that, that's already happened. That's already what, what God offered to us in Jesus. Jesus, the not guilty one, was tried and condemned, even though he was clearly not guilty. He was the only human that ever was really completely not guilty. But he takes our place. The invitation is for us to run to him, to see him as our only hope, because we are guilty. But if we trust in him, we can be set free. We can be declared by a holy God not guilty we can receive the righteousness of Christ himself. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you forgive us through the sacrifice of Christ. I pray that you would make us a people who fully embrace all the glories and the blessings that we have in Scripture as sons and daughters of God, and that we would do that through a restored relationship, one that you've initiated through your work, through Jesus Christ's perfect life, sacrificial death, and resurrection from the dead. We declare that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is not guilty, and we thank you that you've sent him for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'll respond together in communion as a confirmation of our trust in Jesus. This is a way for you to declare uh, to your other brothers and sisters in Christ that we're one because of the sacrifice of Christ. It's also a way that God has given you a gift to remind you that he did give himself for you, that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was spilled. So we invite you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to take part with us this morning as an expression of worship and as a, an expression of your faith in Christ. Uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, we would encourage you to make this a time of spiritual reflection. As everyone walks up to the tables and takes the bread and cup, we'd encourage you, if you're not trusting Jesus, not to take the bread and cup, but to ask yourself what it is you're trusting in. And we would love the privilege of talking that through with you, what it means to trust in Jesus, what it may be that you're trusting in right now. We are all people who walk by faith in something. Uh, we believe that Jesus is worth it, and we'd love to talk to you about that after the service. We're told that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he lifted a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Paul says, as long as Christians eat this bread and drink this cup together, we're declaring that the Lord's death is our only hope of being restored to a holy God. Amen. Amen. You can stand and we'll rotate left to right clockwise to the tables in front of you.
The bread and cup reminds us that Jesus, who was truly not guilty, took our place so that we can be declared not guilty. Amen? Amen. If you have any prayer concerns, we've got a couple available to pray with you after the service. Anything that may be going on, uh, deployment or a worry or just something you're facing or questions about anything, they'd love to pray with you over here. Uh, I'll be available on this side if you have any questions about what we studied today or if you're new, haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you as well. Um, I think that's it. Any other special announcements? I don't think we have anything crazy today. Don't pinch anybody, okay? Don't pinch anybody. We don't do that here. Um, yeah, just want to send you out remembering, again, Jesus is not guilty, and he's the one who knew no sin, who became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. God bless you. You're dismissed. Lift your eyes up, the Son of God rises into the dark. Yes, I fall.